Our next reader is Krista Paravani, who is a 2011 graduate of the MFA program. Krista was born in Albany, New York, and grew up on the Marine Corps base Camp Lejeune in Jacksonville, North Carolina. <clears throat> um, she is the author of the forthcoming memoir, Her. Um, she is also an internationally exhibited photographer, currently represented by Foley Gallery in New York City and Copican Gallery in Los Angeles. A two-time McDowell Fellow, she has taught at University of Massachusetts, Amherst, Dartmouth College, and SUNY Purchase. She lives in Brooklyn, New York, with her husband and their young daughter. Um, and I also want to note that there was a really good article on Krista and her in Rutgers Focus, so check that out. So welcome. Hi. So fantastic to be back here in this gallery. So many readings here. I feel really honored to have been invited to come here for this. This is the first time I've actually read from the manuscript, which uh, will be out in Galley next week. And um, this is the perfect place to do it. <laughs> so I'll be um, reading the um, first chapter of my memoir, Her, which is um, the story of the loss of my identical twin sister, Kara. And um, the book follows us from the time that we're girls until I've recovered from that loss and started my own life separate from her. I used to be an identical twin. I was Kara Paravani's twin. I forgot who I was after my sister died. I tried to remind myself with a trinity mantra. I whispered my mantra to the woman who stared back at me in my morning mirror. I'm twinless. I'm a photographer. I'm Krista. I saw my sister when I tried to see myself. We were 28 when Kara overdosed. We had the dark hair we were born with. We had angular faces, and we fancied red lipstick. We had knobby knees, slightly crooked eye teeth, and fingernails blitten down until they bled. We had a touch of scoliosis. Grade school nurses pulled us into their offices for yearly back checks. Karen had a steppage gait that caused her right foot to drag a little behind her left, an injury she sustained during a car accident in college. My stride is steady, but my posture is horrible. Kara stood straight as a pin. Her shoulders were proud and strong, and she held them back. I slouched. She said, I went round like a little worried pill bug. I'd roll up into a ball tight as a fist. We both flinched at the smallest sounds, slamming doors, quick gestures, and laughter if the pitch was too high. We had looks and fears in common. I gazed at myself in the mirror after she died, and there she was, her rusty brown eyes, frightened and curious as a doe's. In the mirror, I'd smile at myself and see her grinning back. She was a beauty, and her square waist, narrow hips, and round breasts were now mine. I'd imagine all of my sister's regality and blemishes as part of my reflection. I saw Kara's weak chin, her cherry lips pricked into a bow, lipstick smudged at the corners of her mouth. I'd hold out my arms and turn them, exposing my bare forearms. I'd see each one tattooed with a flower from my wrist to my elbow. The stems of the flower started at my pulse and grew up to the crook of my arm, blossomed. Kara had gotten these tattoos after many tough years, images that decorated and repelled. She had wanted to make sure she was rough enough around the edges that she seemed impervious to danger. But the part of her that needed to be dainty and female selected flowers to mar her body. She designed a garden to conceal the evidence of her addiction. Her right forearm she marked with an iris. Its rich purple petals became the target for the puncture of heroin-filled needles. Her left arm, she'd drawn up with a tulip. 
Tulips had been our grandmother Josephine's favorite flower, and the tattoo was meant to pay tribute. Near the end, Kara had run out of good veins. Her tulip soft petals became blighted with track marks. Both of her flowers were drained of ink, which had been slowly replaced by scars. My reflection was her, and it wasn't her. I was myself, but I was my sister. I was hallucinating, Kara. This isn't a metaphor. I learned through reading articles on twin loss that the delusion that one is looking upon their dead twin when really they're looking at themselves is a common experience among identical twinless twins. It is impossible for surviving twins to differentiate their living body from their twins. They become a breathing memorial for their lost half. Kara's reflection became a warning. I would become her on the other side of our looking glass if I wasn't careful. It wasn't only her likeness I craved. For me, her self-destruction was contagious. I mimicked it to try and bring her back, to be nearer to her. I tore apart my life just as she shredded her own. During the closest years of our lives, Kara liked to fasten bobby pins into my hair and admire the updo she invented. We administered weekly sister beautification, little animals that we were. We applied honey face masks, avocado hair glazes, and salt scrubs. We performed on each other the tedious process of individual split end removal with a pair of hair cutting shears. She called me her raven sister with the sexy beehive. I called her my messy unmatching flower goddess. Of course, there were other names the cruel and loving ones we give our siblings. Kara took her nicknames for me with her when she died. Pumpkin seed, digger, shave, and newt. I am the sole historian left to record our lives. It's difficult to know if my memories are true without her. We mixed our memories up. Our lives were a jumble. I can remember being where I never was, in places I never saw my sister's marital chamber on her wedding night, the filthy hotel rooms of her drug buys, sitting at her writing de desk as she tapped away at her keyboard. In October 2001, something terrible happened to my sister, something truly terrible, a capstone to some of the bad things in our lives that had come before. That October, my sister was raped in the woods while she was out walking her dog. One of the consequences of the rape was that she was afraid to be alone. She needed me with her all the time. She asked if I would stay with her in Massachusetts, though she knew I had photography classes to attend in New York City. In my graduate studies, my only assignment was to photograph, which made it relatively simple to accommodate Kara. I selected her as my subject. I suggested she modeled for pictures in exchange I helped her cook and clean and kept her company. She'd feared going outside since the early autumn attack. She shut herself in. Mom bought Kara a treadmill that November, hoping to encourage her to stay active. Kara had rolled the treadmill in front of her television set and walked loops like a hamster on a wheel. She'd quit that stationary machine by the new year. She was ready to brave the forest and followed me outdoors where we took all of our photographs. I spent my free time with her, away from friends and away from my husband. I spent time with Kara from behind the camera and then in front of it with her. Kara refused to dress, so I made adjustment for the pictures that allowed for, the, for this. We wore identical long black cloaks. Kara buttoned hers over her nightshirt and pants painted red lipstick on her mouth, pinked her cheeks. I copied her makeup, became her duplicate. We looked like old-fashioned harlots wearing long black faces and our long black coats. It was the middle of a harsh winter, and I had a vision, identicals in the snow. We trekked over fields covered by feet of snow, so frozen on top that our feet didn't break through the crust. We drove together on Sunday afternoons and looked for bleak rune landscapes, bickering. Have you noticed everyone in New England looks like a pilgrim? Kara asked. 
She stared at a teenage girl making her way down an avenue, hauling a bag of school books. The girl stopped to rest against a building. She caught Kara's gaze, rolled her eyes, and pulled a pack of cigarettes from her knapsack, lighting one up and taking a shallow drag. Um, no, I answered. Well, just look at these people. They're all fat and red-faced and white and wearing big belts. It looks like the Mayflower pulled up to port here. I don't know what you're talking about, I said. I looked through the windshield at the round-faced blonde and low-waisted blue jeans puffing on her cigarette, and I tried to imagine her in a bonnet. In the summers, we switched our black coats to white. Once, I set up a shot in a field of Queen Anne's lace. We dressed surrounded by flowers. Kara slipped both her arms into her coat sleeves and fastened each of the buttons of the coat's toothy linen lapel up to her neck. Who the hell wears a coat in the summer? Kara fussed with the hood, smiled. I do, I guess. She pulled at the coat skirt and swished it back and forth in the tall grass, like a girl admiring the costume she's given for playtime dress-up. Kara stood at the back of the frame. I positioned her to the right, four paces behind, and crossed her hands gingerly over the middle of her waist. I pulled the hood of the coat of the the hood of the coat up over her head, protecting my sweet twin from the horseflies buzzing around us. I looked down at my skirt and found a walking stick making its way to my hands and flicked it off. A moth nested in my hair and frantically flapped its wings. Bees swarmed our skirts. Mosquitoes ravaged our legs. Light poured over our shoulders. We were backlit, sun blazing. I had brought us to the hottest part of heaven. Sometimes, Kara didn't want to have her picture taken. She'd beg not to go out. There were always reasons. She'd had a nightmare and hadn't slept well. The zit blazing red on her chin was a crusty eyesore. She was waiting for an important phone call. It seemed to me that there was ever really only one reason. Kara was jealous that I still had the mind to work and she didn't. If she couldn't work, neither should I. The time we used to take your pictures, I could be writing. Kara would pace her living room as I packed the camera bag, my signal that I was ready to go. Has it even crossed your mind that I work too? This argument happened nearly every time we planned to photograph. She'd wait to speak up until she was fully outfitted in her coat and lipstick. You haven't written a word in months, I'd argue back, dressed exactly as she was. We looked like Victorian misfits sounding off spitfires. You have nothing but free time and waste it trolling the internet, I said. This line of interrogation usually brought on tears for both of us. What do you even know about me anymore, she asked. She was right. I didn't recognize her. I felt like a woman stumbling through a pitch black room looking for a hidden light switch. I can't stay here with you unless you let me take your picture, I said, scaring her that I'd really leave. I'll fail school. It was true enough that I'd have to make other plans to work, but really, I was falling in love with the pictures we made. The tension between us as we stood together in a meadow, the forest, or by the seaside was palpable. I was desperate to keep going, to keep shooting to see what we could make. After my sister died, I saw her in my pictures as well as in my mirror. Was this a punishment for having used her as a model? I'd manipulated her for stacks of exposed film. I'd gotten her to pose when she didn't want to. I'd asked until she cried and gave in. This was a shame I suffered after she died. Hadn't I killed her with my camera? Wrinkles came early for Kara. By 28, she'd lived hard years. Crow's feet and frown lines had begun to etch her skin, though not deeply enough for anyone other than her twin to notice. Her chain-smoking, heroin-slamming, X-dropping, and poor diet aged her beyond me. The age line starting on Kara's neck in the photographs began deepening on me in the mirror after she died. 
Her hair, which swirled on her shoulders in brassy, Revlon-toned auburn waves, was now my own. I dyed mine to match hers. When I grew tired of Kara's hair, I colored mine bla black again. Round and round went the cycle of bleach and darken. My hair dried to the texture of hay, chemical burned, brittle, broken. My stylist gave me a trim and demanded I stopped. I was the smaller of the identicals. One twin always has a rounder face. I was the one with the narrow face. We were called the girls. Mom called us her ladies. Kara called me her. One twin goes and the other must follow. The big temptation after my sister died was to overdose or shoot myself. I got ready to die. I starved. I lied and I swallowed pills. I wet my burial bed. I cut my arms with a knife. I divorced. I refused sleep out of fear of dreaming of Kara. I allowed any man who wanted me to fuck my body of bones so I wouldn't have to be by myself. I lived alone in a house I filled with my sister's furniture. I crashed cars and I quit my job. I checked myself into mental hospitals. I scared our mother. I turned myself into Kara. I wanted to chase my sister into the afterlife. I saved myself at the brink of our two worlds. I cheated my own death. What one twin gets, the other must have. I declined my piece of our whole. I became a woman who owns half a story. I lived. I spent years in the shroud of her white tattered scarf from Nepal. I wore her wedding rings and her favorite dresses. I slept into, in them until they tore. So be it. I love her. I love her like I love no one else. I am in love with Kara. And if I couldn't die with her, I could write my sister back to life. I learned another language, posthumous twin talk. I began to communicate with my sister by writing. When I write, I feel my sister come as close as I'll allow. Kara's dying meant there was a strong chance I would join her. I researched our situation and read somewhere that 50% of twins follow their identical twins into death within two years. That statistic did not discriminate amongst cancer, suicide, or accident. The second twin goes by illness or the intolerable pain of loneliness. Flip a coin. Those were my chances of survival. Certainly we talked about what we'd do if one of us died before the other. The answer was always suicide, and our plans were the plots of girls who never suspected they'd really lose the other. We'd schemed since grade school about how we'd seal our pact. In the case of illness, we'd hold a bedside vigil and ingest a dose of cyanide. In case of an accident, the injured twin was not allowed to die until she stumbled to a payphone and called the other. The unharmed twin would take her life by whatever means she possessed. Drano, phone cord, knife, swan dive from a cliff. Thank you.